I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network. This is James Altucher with the James Altucher Show, and... Once again, I'm back with Lewis Howes. Lewis, you were on a year ago. Yeah. Uh, and, that long ago? Yeah, it was a year. Oh, my gosh. And I don't even know if we've even really spoken since then. Like, we've, <laughs> I mean, we've like, yeah, emailed yeah. occasionally. Yeah. But um, how's it going? It's going <laughs> phenomenal, man. Yeah, thanks for asking. I mean, I, I know a lot of things have happened to you this year yeah. from, from everything. We're, and we're going to go through the full range. But I first off, just as a brief intro, you were a professional football player. Uh, injuries stopped you from that. Uh, you built up from sleeping on your sister's couch to building million-dollar businesses. And we talked all about that on our our, our last podcast. Um, I know this year you were getting really into professional handball, and I don't know, were you like in the Olympics or something, or the World Championships? I'm on the USA <laughs> national team, and I went to Brazil for a couple weeks to train, and then Uruguay to play in a tournament. And currently, I'm training. I guess depending when this comes out, I'm training with the USA national team, and hopefully, we have a tournament coming up against Uruguay. If we win that tournament, we'll go on to the Pan American Games. If we win the Pan American Games, we go to the Olympics. Now, I don't mean this to sound in any way, but in South America, don't they have tennis rackets? Like, <laughs> they have to play with their hand on yeah. on the ball, yes. so... For, well, for most people that don't know, there's two different types of handball. Uh-huh. So there's a, ball, there's a handball that Brooklyn and New York understands where you hit a ball against the wall with your hand. Right. So it's, like hand it's like tennis without the racket. The handball I play, for those that don't know, is like water polo without the water. So if you can imagine uh, a bunch of people playing against each other or like soccer with your hands on a big basketball court. Okay. So that's a sport that I play. Most Americans have never heard of it. So that mean there's like a hoop? There's a net. So imagine mm. like a smaller soccer field or imagine okay. like a, a lacrosse field but on a basketball court. Okay. With two nets, a goalie, and you have to throw it past the goalie to get in the goal. It's basically soccer with your hands. Lacrosse with your arms, if you want to. So you can catch the ball. Catch it, dribble, run, pass, jump, and throw. Yeah. 
Okay. I'll send you a video. What got you into that? And, and by the way, we're going to, I, I want to set the stage here. Sure. In this podcast, I'm going to totally ruin your podcast because <laughs> I'm either going to promote your podcast or I'm going to ruin it because we're going to dive into everything you've ever talked about in your podcast. <laughs> so all people have to do is listen to this hour. Perfect. But, uh, or people could go back and listen to your podcast and continue to listen to it. But I, I do want to understand handball. So, so you can, you can catch it. You can. Yeah. Imagine a mini soccer ball. Mm -hmm. You're dribbling. You can catch. It's pretty, it's pretty heavy and. And, and dense. So if you throw it hard and hit someone, it's going to hurt. Um, <clears throat> but basically, there, you know, the object of the goal of the of the game is to score the most amount of points mm -hmm. in the time period. Two teams running up and down a court. You can hit pretty hard. You can't tackle people, but you can hit them. You can wrap them up. You can dribble. You can pass. You can take three steps without a dribble. Then you have to pass, shoot, or dribble. And, uh, it seems like the combination of every sport on the awesome. planet. <laughs> it's amazing. The reason I found it, I was uh, on my sister's couch. I just got off my cast. Just got my cast off from my injury. Uh, this was the injury that got got you out of football. Yeah, when I retired from football, I had to have surgery on my wrist. You can see the scar right here. Hmm. So I was in a cast for six months. Got the cast off. It was the Olympics of 2008 in Beijing. And I was watching Inspired for two weeks, and it was about, I don't know, 2 a.m. or something. Were you feeling, like, jealous? Like, oh, I just got I was, crushed yeah, out of sports, depressed. and here are the best athletes in the world. Yes. And my whole dream my whole life was to be an Olympian, to mm. go to the Olympics. I thought that would be the ultimate goal as an athlete. So I'm watching, and I started actually thinking, like, what are the sports that I could hack to make as an American to go qualify for the Olympics? The only things I could think of were, like, curling and kayaking. Because everything else had too much skill. I was like... You didn't think of moving to, like, another country where maybe. they had, like, they weren't good at some sport? I want to represent the USA. Yeah. I was like, if I'm going to do it, i got to represent my country. I'm too patriotic right. to go play for someone else. So, all of a sudden, there were these highlights for, like, 30 seconds of this clips of team handball, which is the sport I play. And I was mesmerized. I was like this is my ticket to go to the Olympics. I was like, I don't know what this sport is, but it looks amazing. It looks like it's perfect for me and my athleticism. So I started researching nonstop and became obsessed with learning about this sport. There was no professional league in the U.S. It was just a big, you know, it's really big in Europe, majority. So there was, there was a national team, though, that I saw, and then there were club teams all around the country in major cities. I was living in Ohio and Columbus. There was no team in Ohio. So after doing research for a while, trying to contact the United States team, the, the presidents, the organization reps, no one would get back to me for like a year. I would email, I would call, no one would respond. It's a very small organization. I saw that the national champions for the amateur club teams was in New York City. And I said, okay, if no one's going to get back to me, what I'm going to have to do is make enough money so I can move to New York City and learn this sport to see if I've got a chance. Because I didn't want to go be, you know, 40 years old and say, you know what, there was a sport that I could have tried, but I didn't try because I was afraid of failure. So I was like, I'm going to go and just try out, see if I can make the team, see if I'm good enough to make the USA national team. And then who knows what the Olympics, but at least I give my best. So within two years, I was going from broke at this moment. I have no money. I'm on my sister's couch, but I'm starting to dive into LinkedIn. And I think on the previous episode interview I talk about LinkedIn yeah yeah you you described just for listeners who, who didn't hear that one you described how basically you use LinkedIn to first build contacts then then build webinars then yeah. charge for the webinars and you built a seven-figure business yeah. this way and we're going to get a little into that your yes. by the way your podcast is called the school of greatness we're going to get into all the aspects of greatness but I want to hear yeah. how you dominated handball so for those that want to know how I built my business you can go listen to that episode after this one um, but I had this vision. I was like, okay, I've got to go to New York City, but I'm not going to go broke because I want to go with money so that I can be comfortable. But I didn't know how to make money. So if you want to learn about the process of how I did that, go listen to the last episode. You know, by the way, not to interrupt, but yeah. uh, George, uh, I remember reading George Bush the uh first -huh. uh, told – uh, George Bush the second. Don't get into politics until you make your first ten million. Wow. So similar advice. Interesting. <laughs> similar advice to what you did. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, I just wanted to be able to survive in New York and not have to like sleep on a couch in New York while I'm trying to learn this sport. So for the next two years, I I made a good amount of money where I felt like okay, I've got a lot saved. I've got my business running. I felt comfortable. 
And so I moved to New York City. Now, the New York City team did not respond to my emails either. Why wouldn't they respond? At know. least to say, hey, this is not right for us or we're full. Or... I don't know. It was the same thing with the USA team and the New York team was just like. Were you sending the wrong email? I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? But no one got back to me. But they had their uh, practice schedule address on their website. So I said, I'm just going to show up. And so I came to New York City. I moved here. I was like coming for a month. I was like, I'm going to try this. I'm going to show up. I show up and I say, hey, guys, my name is Lewis Howes from Ohio. Never played handball, but my goal is to make the USA national team and go to the Olympics. And they laughed. They all laughed their asses off. And it was I was the only American there. So it was about 20, 25 people, all former pro team handball players from Europe and all over the world that had moved to New York for jobs or families mm-hmm. and were playing for fun now on this club team. So they all laughed. We're speaking in like 10 different languages to each other about this like white kid who's never played. But I, every week I showed up to practice for that year. Every week. And I was like committed to learning the sport. Was it kind of like because you were already, uh, you had been a professional football yeah. player, do you feel like it was sort of like learning a second language, like learning Italian after learning Spanish in that the same kind of um, yeah. practice, the same kind of language of movement? Uh, do, you feel, do you feel like you benefited from already turning pro in one sport? Yeah, I feel like it's more like, I think language, I don't know, I've never learned another language, so I don't, can't relate to that. But it'd be like learning, I learned salsa dancing, which was really challenging and took me a while to figure out. So that'd be like my football. And then trying to learn like the tango or some other style of dance that's mm-hmm. similar, but very... There's different like styling and techniques that you still have to learn and master that takes a while. So it's like you can jump in and still be semi-effective and look like you know what you're doing, but it takes time to develop. Um, But within nine months of practicing, I got the call from the U.S. uh, national team, and they brought me on to play. What about all these other club players? Were they upset that you got the call? I was the only American. So Ah. you can't take, you know, if you don't have a U.S. passport, you can't go. Yeah. You can't be even considered. You have to have a U.S. passport. So all these guys, they were happy for me. You know, they a lot of them have played their national teams back in uh, in Europe. Uh-huh. So they were happy for me. You know, there's nothing they could do. They couldn't play on the U.S. team. So it was, uh, and it's been a journey ever since. It's been, you know, four years of practicing and training, and I've been played with the team a number of times. And have you been winning? Uh, How's it going? It's a struggle because we only get together like a week or two before a tournament. where We play Brazil or Argentina. And these guys practice every single day. They've been playing since they were like 10. They play professionally in Europe every day. And they have lots more money and backing to come together and practice together. So we really don't... It's like if we played basketball against any of these other teams, we would dominate. Because we're just so good at that. Which is what happens in the Olympics. (laughs) Exactly. But when we come together and we play them in handball, we can keep up for like a half... Um, maybe even a little longer, but then their experience just takes over, and they just know the game so well. Do they laugh at us? I no, say us, like I'm yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, we, we put a pretty good fight. I mean, some games we win, some games we lose. It's just like the top teams, we haven't been able to compete with like the best of the best in the world. Have you ever been able to beat Argentina? I just have to tell Claudia if her team not is good or not. Ball. Not in handball. <laughs> All not right. That's... But they're good guys. I've played against them. They qualified for the Olympics last time, so it's cool to be able to say... I've competed against guys who played in the Olympics. And now does the United States send an Olympic team? Obviously they do. The only way you can qualify is if you win the Pan American Games. Ah. So it's one tournament every four years. And if you don't win that, you don't go. So they take one Uh, country from North and South America to play handball in the Olympics, which is kind of... Wait, North America? Who else is? Who else do you play against? Does Mexico uh, have a good team? Mexico, no, we beat them usually. Uh But uh, South America's got a lot of good teams. Brazil, Argentina. But one from North America, one from South America. Who beat you in North America? One total. Oh, one one total from the Western Hemisphere? North and South America, total. That's not fair. I know. If it was one of each, then we'd probably qualify. Oh, somebody has to complain about that. I know, right? Where's the Olympics when well, you need Well, I'm hoping that? that Boston gets the bid in 20, uh, what is that, like 10 years. <laughs> oh, yeah, because then they have to send you, right? Well, then it's an automatic qualifier. So if I'm still healthy and still competing, there's a chance. Are you going to be 40 then? Yeah, I'll be 40. Yeah, 2024, I think, is when it could be. So I'll be 40 by then. Uh, all right. Is a long shot. Well. But you never know. I'm good luck. Playing. Thank <laughs> you. I'm going to keep playing until as long as I can. So so what I wanted to do 
your podcast is called The School of Greatness, mm -hmm. and I've listened to some episodes, and in fact, we've had a lot of guests in common. Yeah. Tony Robbins was a guest in common. By the way, how'd you get Tony Robbins as a guest? Uh, Ryan, I was like, he said that Tony, he was working with Tony on some of his online marketing stuff for his book launch, and I go, I'll do whatever it takes to get him on my show. And he goes, I don't know. It's been, you know, he's kind of tapped out on all the podcast interviews, but I'll introduce you to the marketing team. We'll see what happens. Introduced me. It basically got canceled twice. I had to change flights. I probably spent like three. Do you go down to his house? I came here to New York during oh. his whole uh, PR tour. See, I flew down to his house saw that, like yeah. a month earlier. How was that? It was it was a it was great. Like I mean, he has an unbelievable house. It was an experience, kind of seeing the team and seeing him in his like home place. And he wasn't going from you know. I'm sure it was good also when he was doing the podcast yeah. tour, uh, which I think is sort of the new book tour. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I encourage all authors to do podcasts rather than bookstores. So you hit like you know hundreds of thousands of people versus tens of people. You stay in your house. Yeah, exactly. So Just do it over Skype. Right. So so. Um, but I was really happy to just go down there. I wanted to make it as easy as possible for him. Well, how, long so, did, how much time did he give you? Um, well, I think it was a little over an hour. Like, we had a, a good, solid conversation. So. And then it was kind of like, see you later? Or would he hang out with you for a little bit? Or is it... Um, we we took a walk outside by his pool, took photographs, you know, the whole thing. Yeah, then then we were out there. Yeah, yeah. so they were going so, to India or something the next right. day. Yeah. So I was supposed to. He he canceled it. Uh, his team canceled it because they were going to India, and so I had to rechange my flights and rebook uh, camera team and everything else. But it was totally worth it and a great experience. Isn't it funny how Tony Robbins is? He's I would have to say he's one of the most quote unquote famous people I've interviewed, but it's not like, so like take a guy like Mark Cuban who's built multi-billion dollar businesses. Uh, Mark Cuban's very famous as well, but somehow Tony Robbins really resonates with millions of people. So and, cool. and I think it's a part in part because everybody at first saw him on infomercials in the nineties, but also he's legitimately helped millions of people through his books and, yeah. and teachings and stuff. So yeah. It was, it was a good podcast. So, yeah. um, but I want to hit your other podcast that I didn't listen to, okay. and I want to I want to get completely from you everything you learned from them, so Perfect. I don't have to listen to them. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, you did one podcast: How to Double Your Energy. Mm -hmm. How can I double my energy? Oh, this is all about greatness now. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of great points that he had, but uh, the, who who was? It? I don't even know who it was. Uh, his name is Yuri. I think it's how I pronounce the last name is Elkine. I'm going to butcher it, but it's Yuri Elkine. And uh, he's a New York Times bestselling author, but <clears throat> really a lot of it has, from all these people that I've interviewed about health, one of the key things that I can pull away from this is sleep, is one of the key things. I, I actually strongly agree with that. Just in all of my research on it, health rejuvenates you, rejuvenates the brain yeah. cells, gives you energy, yes. prevents you from being sick. Yes. But what, what did he say? He said uh, that, that, you know, caffeine is something that's not going to double your energy. Hmm. I mean, a lot of people use caffeine to give them energy and get them excited or get them up, but really caffeine is something that's the opposite of what you should be doing. And I've been pretty much caffeine-free since uh, I was, you know, probably 22, let's say. What about Dave Asprey's Bulletproof Coffee, since you had Dave Asprey yeah, on your podcast? Different, completely different, uh, you know, belief. He thinks that, like, it's good for you and that it's going to give you long-lasting energy because there's no crash with his beans and his process. Right. The Bulletproof process. Uh, and when I take Bulletproof, and I'll sip on it every now and then, I shouldn't say I'm caffeine-free. I have, you know, maybe caffeine like once every couple of weeks. I'll mm -hmm. have, like, a cappuccino just for fun every once in a while. But I try to be caffeine-free as much as possible. When I drink Bulletproof, uh, it's like a lot for my body. I'm a pretty big guy, but since I don't take any stimulants mm -hmm. and I never take medicine and I don't drink alcohol, my body can feel the effects. And I get a little, like, shaky if I drink too much. Mm -hmm. It becomes a little too much. So I just try to sip on a little bit of it. I think it tastes good, but it's just like I'm not a coffee drinker and I'm not in that habit. So so Yuri, though, says sleep. How much does he want people to sleep? Yeah. <sighs> You're trying to make me remember it all now. but I And is this the main thing he said to double your energy? It's just, no, I mean, there's a lot about the foods you have. Hmm. And uh, he also talked about doing a – once a week he does a fast where he doesn't eat one day a week. Hmm. And he says that really helps your body if your digestive system is constantly – working, your body's going to have to use that energy to digest your food. So he says after you have a big meal, 
you get tired sometimes. We have sleep coma or we have uh, food comas, right? Where mm-hmm. you're like, oh, I'm exhausted because your body's trying to break down all the gluten and all the bad stuff. Uh, when you give your digestive system a break, your body then has that energy to use in other areas. So you feel more awake. You don't feel tired because it's not digesting constantly and working. And um, he says a lot of things about gluten, not having gluten. It's, it's really bad for your energy. It's just the science has proven it's going to bring your energy levels down. I feel like science has ruined my life in the past <laughs> few years. Like this whole gluten thing, I've tried it too. I try paleo. Yeah. I, 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 as much as I can, I try it. But it's very difficult because I just love starch. And I love bread yeah. so much. Like I could just dip it. But it really is bad for you though. It's so bad, yeah. I mean it's not bad. It's just I think it takes your energy levels down. Yeah. So I guess bad is whatever you make it. I mean, if you want to be tired, then it's not bad. How much does he, does he suggest you sleep? Like eight hours, I think nine hours? Like seven, eight hours. Yeah. And I mean, I can't remember specifically what he said there, but I think it's about eight hours because I had a sleep expert on uh, recently as well, um, Sean Stevenson, and he talks about creating. He has like everything broken down to the perfect environment for your sleep, and he says that basically you want to create a sleep sanctuary. And you want to turn off all electronics two hours before you go to bed. You ideally want to go to bed between 10 and 11 p.m., but shut off all electronics between two hours beforehand. Um, Or if you're going to be on the phone or watching TV, to wear special glasses that... I, I get those. I get. Ar- I have orange I, glasses. I just ordered them, but I haven't worn them yet. Yeah, so it makes so even if you look at a screen, which I avoid before two hours before sleep anyway. Uh-huh. But even if you look at a screen, it still looks like night. That's great. So I'm going to be trying that when I get the glasses. And you have to get blackout drapes also. Blackout drapes, he said. But I also said there's a specific plant you want to have in your room. Oh, really? That creates oxygen, more oxygen at night. That it's like the only plant that does this. What plant? Do you it's remember? Called the snake plant. So you want to get the snake plant, and my my assistant Sarah, when I'm heading back to LA here next week, she's already ordered all this stuff for me. So I'm gonna have a sleep sanctuary when I get back. But basically, this plant creates more oxygen at night and helps you sleep better. So he's like, you want to stack the um, variables in your favor for sleeping the best way possible. I also said, well, what if you're like this busy entrepreneur that has all these ideas and you just want to like create, create, create? I've got a lot of ideas at night. And I know you probably do as well. And he goes, I have a process where before bed, I make sure I complete everything I need to be completed, write everything down that I need to do the next day so I'm not thinking about it. And then he does a process on the side of his bed where he basically closes the day. He's like, all right. He says everything he needs to say. He like, let's go of all of his thoughts. And he's like, I'm going to close tonight. And I'm going to let it go and, and let it come tomorrow. So he's got a whole process for having the maximum amount of sleep so his body has full energy throughout the day. So it doesn't matter uh, what he puts in his body, but he just has natural energy. The blackout drapes, creating a sanctuary. There's different sounds that you can create to optimize your sleep. Um, but definitely check out the snake plant as well. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. The snake plant. <laughs> Get Claudia to buy that. Yeah. Um, so... Let me see if I can read my own handwriting here. Master your memory. Uh-huh. You had uh, a whole, Quick. yeah, you had a whole podcast about that. Man, this was a powerful podcast. Do you know Jim Quick? I don't know you him. You should get him on, actually. All right, I will. The intro. He's. Uh, Is that his real name, Jim Quick? Jim Quick. Jimmy yeah. Quick. He sounds like a like a superhero name. It is. Yeah, he's got a superhero HQ. Is his uh, home up in the top of Hollywood Bull uh, Hollywood uh, Hills, and I did this interview with him, the thing that I can take away from this, there was a lot of great tips. I'm like remembering names uh, because a lot of people have issues with remembering names. If you're at a party, how do you remember 10 people you just met and respond them back? I heard Jim give a speech one time and there was probably 30 different people that he called out from random in the audience where he said, give me two different numbers like 1422 or 6117. So each person gave two different numbers and Someone was writing them in the back on like a big wall that he couldn't see. And he's remembering them. He's speaking them out loud. He's talking to each person. He probably gets 20 or 30 numbers from people. And then he recites them all exactly how they were said to him. And then he does it backwards to forwards. But within like a few minutes after he did this, he probably took a 10 minute break and was having a conversation and then went and did this. And I was like, this is amazing. Does he do like, you know, there's kind of that palace of memory thing where you make a room for each person and then yes. you put their stuff in there? Yes. Okay. Similar to that. 
Hmm. Uh, he talked about it more like a, a walkway through like a like a field to like a house, like you're going on a. I'm more a luxury driven, yeah, so. Exactly. <laughs> But he did this – it was amazing. It blew my mind. We did this extra video afterwards, and I said, okay, if I'm trying to remember, let's say, 10 points to a speech or five points or whatever it may be, what's the best way to approach this if you're a speaker on stage? And he blew my mind. He goes, okay, give me a minute. Let me think about it. And he takes like a minute, and he's like – I see him off and like uh, a few feet away from me, just kind of like in his own mind. And he's like, all right, cool. Let's start the cameras rolling. So we got the film crew there, and he's like, okay – you know, you did a great podcast this morning that just came out. That was called The 10 Truths to Take Your Life to the Next Level in 2000. Uh, what is it? 2015, right? Yeah. 10 Truths. And he's like, <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to walk you through how I remember this and how you can remember anything with 5, 10, however many steps you want. And so he's walking me through this. And he's like, okay, before I walk you through this, I want you to imagine on the top of your head that there's lots of reading glasses. So imagine you wear glasses and you put them on your head and there's 10, 20, 30 reading glasses that are just sitting above your head floating there. So imagine reading glasses, touch the top of your head and imagine and visualize reading glasses. Then I want you to imagine um, <clears throat> a stethoscope up your nose. So imagine stuffing a stethoscope up your nose and he goes through that process. And he says, then imagine eating books. So you're eating books and you're chewing on them and you're, you're just shoving books in your mouth. Then I want you to imagine um, Tony Robbins speaking into your ear. So he's up into your ear. He's speaking, coaching you into your ear. Then he goes, then I want you to imagine that you have gratitude and, and uh, boards on your shoulders. So you're looking to your left and your right and you've got these boards on your shoulders. And he walked through five more steps. Uh, but I already remember those first five. And and after he walks through those 10 steps of like all over my body, these different things that he placed on my body, he says, okay, so point one that you talked about, I'm going to tell you your 10 tips for having a great life in 2015. Point number one is you got to have a clear vision. And he's like putting his hand above his head. He's like, you got to have a clear vision. And what was the thing that we had above our head? It was reading glasses. And he's like, okay, yes. Yeah, so clear vision you got to have. Uh, the next one is you got to master your health. So imagine sticking a stethoscope up your nose, uh, you know, a doctor's health. You got to ma you got to master your health. Uh, the third one was, uh, books. He's like, you got to feed your mind. So you got to feed yourself positive books and read and go to workshops and podcasts. The next one was you got to find a coach. You got to have a great coach. If you want to have a great business and life in 2015, so imagine Tony Robbins speaking into your ear, coaching you. And then I said, uh, he said, with the gratitude boards, you've got to express your gratitude towards other people. And you got to be grateful for all you do have, not what you don't have. So imagine these gratitude boards. And he walked through these 10 different points, and I was just blown away. I was like, how does someone else? I didn't even remember the 10 points, and I just put it out that morning. So that's funny. So he must have done that while he was listening to the podcast. Exactly. And he said, So he must be doing that all day long. Constantly. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I can remember numbers from speeches that I asked questions like 10 years ago. Hmm. I can remember those 30 numbers or those names of people. And it was just like amazing. And he was like, it's definitely the reason I'm so good at it is because I wasn't good at it as a child. And but I wonder if he creates like a passion for himself. Like I find uh, I'm, I can remember things from 30 years ago if I was really passionate about it 30 years ago yeah. but I can't remember anything else like that's just it yeah I think there's got to be a motive behind like why you want to remember otherwise it's going to be hard to remember and he talks mm. about that as part of the memory process is like finding the motive to why you want to remember this person's name why it's valuable and important to you to remember the name to remember the speech whatever it may be and then you're going to tap into your memory a little bit better uh, that's really interesting. I'm going to start. So I'm, I'm getting like huge value here by I'm getting a year's worth of value from your podcast. Exactly. We got to bring it. You got to get him on. I think you'll really love. I will. Yeah. He reminds me of, um, you know, I watched um, and I want to get this guy on my podcast. Uh, do you know Apollo Robbins? He's sometimes called the gentleman thief. Yeah. And he really knows um, kind of uh, 
psychology very well. So he knows how to get into your space and then basically pick your pocket. That's and he's done it. Yeah, he, he's done it with like all sorts of famous people. Like uh, he did it with the Secret Service. He would like take a, a gun from them or whatever. Amazing. Yeah, and he's. Uh, I've seen him before. Him. He's a like really Darren incredible Brown? guy. Have you seen Darren? Brown? No. In the UK, he does that too. It's like blows my mind. I wish I had a skill like that. <laughs> right? It's amazing. <laughs> So you focus a lot on health stuff, but we've we've talked about that. Um, let me see what I've written down here. Um, you want to hear some of my uh, common themes of greatness that I pulled from all these episodes? Yeah, you actually have your top ten lessons and breakthroughs from twenty fourteen. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what were those? What did you, if you can remember well, them? Those were those were the first five right there. <laughs> Um, but then you also had ways to conquer 2015. So yeah. you had two different. Too bad I didn't learn the memory <laughs> trick. By then. So I have to go back and look at the show notes for that, and I could speak into it. But <clears throat> some of these things I'm going to share right now cover that. Um, one of the things that I've pulled from, I guess, my life experience and from all the people that I've been interviewing are these common lessons of greatness. And I always ask people, you know, what's their definition of greatness? I'm, I'm asking questions to speak into how they've become so great and what makes other people great. So I feel like I've done a pretty decent job so far of discovering some of these key lessons. And <clears throat> the first one always comes down to vision. And we talked about this just before, but vision, so many people who are great have a clear vision. It's like so crystal clear on what they want to achieve and why they want to achieve it. And then they allow themselves to get rid of every distraction along the way. <clears throat> so that's one of the things that I see is a necessity based on the people I've interviewed and in my own experience is when I am clear and I focus on creating that clarity and eliminating those distractions, I set myself up to win to achieve that. It doesn't mean I'm always going to achieve what I want, but it sets me up to win for that. I agree, but often along the way, your vision might get. You got to be flexible too. Yeah, because you yes. like like look look at your case where you were trying to be a professional football player and you had yeah. And so my my vision was not I was not able to achieve that anymore. So I had to be able to be flexible and adjust and adapt and be like okay, well it's not my you know. And you had to come back from a low point. Very low. Point. So what what is let's say three or four techniques for coming back from a low point that you have kind sure. of uncovered? Yeah. And you've talked to a lot of people who've come back from low exactly. points. And that's actually the second key of greatness is learning how to master overcoming adversity and turning adversity into an advantage. And I know Ryan Holiday talks a lot about that in his last book. But that's what the greatest individuals have done. They have such big dreams and visions that, of course, there's going to be injuries or breakdowns, massive breakdowns along the way. Or people trying to attack them, people trying to take them down, whatever it may be. Or maybe you go bankrupt in your business or you lose all your money, then you got to figure out how to go back. You've done that, what, 20 times now. Yeah, right? something like something that, like unfortunately. That. And you know what? It doesn't feel good. Like people do say, and I've heard you say this in your podcast, you know, that it, that it's not necessarily the destination, it's the journey. And I sort of believe that. But, but at the sucks. same time, yeah, it really feels bad to yes. fail. I yes. really don't encourage people to fail in, as a path to getting better because yeah. it just feels so bad. It's just not worth it. Yeah. So some ways to overcome uh, the adversity when you get knocked off from my own personal experience is <clears throat> surrounding yourself with really positive people because I think our emotions are, I'll speak for myself. When this happened to me, my emotions were really shaky. And even though I was this big, tough jock, like I was pretty upset and emotionally broken up inside. Like just losing my dream was, it was uh, a huge blow for me. And so did around, you let people see that? Like, I think I, I think I tried to hide a lot of it. I think I tried to like stuff it down and just be like, I'm good. You know, did you think you needed to talk to somebody? Like, did you see a therapist or no, I think I, I talked to like my siblings and my, my parents were really like supportive and mentors. And that was enough therapy for me. I think in a moment mm -hmm. to be able to like talk it out and feel like I was heard. I think just having people uh, feeling the need to be heard when stuff's not going your way can do a, can, can go a long way. I think that is incredibly important. Yeah. So surrounding yourself with really supportive people, not people that said, I told you so, you're an idiot, you're a failure, you're never going to do anything, that's not going to support you. Being around love, the energy of love, I think, is what's going to support that. The next thing is, for me, giving yourself time to be in that messy space and being okay with it. 
Now, I was probably, you know, I was recovering for six months and then another six months just trying to do rehab when I was on my sister's couch. And it got to be about a year and a half in where I was in limbo to where my sister was so loving and supportive and my family was. But then my sister was like, don't you think it's time you start to help me pay the rent hmm. after a year and a half? Hmm. So there needs to be a point where you're like, okay, you're going to start doing something else in your life. Or you're going to start moving forward in some way. So I don't know what that time frame is, if it's a month, a week, a day a year. I don't know. But I was obviously learning and growing. I was like doing work during that time. I just wasn't making any money. So figuring, giving yourself time to be a little messy and recover from the blow, supporting, having supportive people around you. And then I think the most important thing is getting clear on what you want next and having a support team and a coach to help you get there. And have you seen this a lot from your guests on, on the show? Yeah. Or are they kind of already, you know, on super steroids, just doing their thing and and don't really want to get back to that point on the show? Um, No, I I go there with a lot of people on the show and and talk Mm -hmm. about that, like what they went through and things like that when they had big blows. And a lot of it is a support team. A lot of it is, um, you know, taking the time and then getting clear on it again, how to get back to where they are. So, yeah, I think one of the things that's interesting that I've just, that just opened up for me right now is all the greatest athletes that I interview have amazing coaches. Every one of them, gold medalists, they all have great coaches. Not every one of the greatest like business minds have great coaches, but some of them also do have coaches. I think that people are missing out if they don't have a coach in every area of their life. And I'm like, I'm constantly questioning myself, like, Am I, do I have the, do I need a coach for relationships? If I'm in a great relationship, I think I still do because even if I'm at the bat, the top of my game, um, in any sport, I'm still want a coach to like, show me what I'm doing or help me like figure out what's missing in the gap to help me get to the next level. Do you think, do you think, um, reading could to some extent replace that coach? Yeah. Like almost like a virtual coach. Yeah. Cause let's say I read. Thomas Jefferson's autobiography sure. as an example. I, I don't know why I picked his name, but certainly having the curated thoughts of this guy's mind is going to affect my life yeah. or, or Albert yeah. Einstein's, whatever he writes or whoever. I think it can help up to like 80, 90 percent. I also mm-hmm. think like <clears throat> if you're Kobe Bryant, you don't need a coach. Mm-hmm. And say Kobe was like, well, what if I just read uh, Phil Jackson's book about basketball every week and I watched game film and I watched speeches and I read other books, he'd still be a great basketball player and still be one of the best. But I think to be able to have the feedback constantly every week or for him daily, every practice, uh, having guidance and feedback is so valuable. Even if someone's not coaching you, just giving you feedback on what's working and what's not working. I think, I, I think that is important. I think if you don't have necessarily a coach in your life, it's good to find uh, at least an accountability partner. Yes. So you mentioned, you know, being around people who love and support you. A lot of these people could be good accountability partners to at least make sure you're moving forward. Did this guy talked about sleep? Did you get enough sleep? Did you yes. get the snake Are plan? You tracking or, your sleep? Yeah, you know, tracking it and have someone check in with you like once a month. What was working? You know, what? How, how did you feel when you? Had the six-hour nights. How was your days like? Okay, what can we do to get you back on track? Just simple little tweaks that a coach can support you with. So so you're working on all these things with podcasting, uh-huh. with obviously improving your life in various ways. You're working on the, uh, you know, winning the handball tournaments. What What's going on with business? Like, are you yeah. moving upwards and onwards? <laughs> yeah. You know, my, my intention <clears throat> this year is really to build a distribution network. And so the podcast is growing. It's been a lot of fun and I'm in it for a marathon. It's not like I need to be here right now. Mm -hmm. I understand where it's going to go. I just hit two years over the weekend. Congratulations. I saw that. And uh, it was like, wow, it's only, it's been around for two years. It's been like so fast, but so long at the same time. And it's cool to to experience like what's happened in the, every month just seems like to get bigger and bigger and, and a deeper impact for people that listen to it. I don't know if I'm getting better on these interviews or if I'm bringing on, you know, different guests or what it is, but it just seems to be starting to almost hit that tipping point where I'm like, 
All right, it's making an impact globally in some in some ways. And do you think this is bringing in also uh, customers to your business? Definitely, it's bringing a lot of customers. I mean, I have an online academy called the School of Greatness Academy. That's a six month, basically coaching program with a community, and it's all based around kind of these principles of greatness to help people in their life and take their business to the next level. And uh, and we have a mutual friend that I know has greatly benefited from it, uh, Molly Han, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, and I don't know how she does it, Doodler. but she just – she doodles Buddhas every yeah, day. Great. And now she's making a six-figure income from it. It's yeah. It's but great. she took your course. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a lot of fun. I mean I'm directly seeing, you know, business results – from the podcast, uh, I ask people when they sign up for the program, where did you find me? They say, I first found you from your podcast. So I know that it's working that way. I think people have to realize this, that podcasting itself, just like book writing, book writing might not be a business model for for many writers. Yeah. Like, you're, like you might write a book and you'll make a little bit of money but not much money. Mm-hmm. But you have to think of all the other things that it gets you. It gets you an audience. It gets you those true fans. It gets you – uh, it, it allows you to have impact on people who maybe you could have then impact again in the future. Yeah. And I think podcast is, is, is similar. It's not like we're going to create, you know – the, the American Podcasting Network or, or whatever. Uh, I mean, maybe that will happen. Yeah. I'm still, I don't know. I, it's hard to predict the future of podcasting. Yeah. I know I enjoy doing it, but it's hard to predict. It's hard to predict, but I remember, two, when did you start, a year ago? Yeah, almost exactly, oh, I would say exactly a year ago, almost to the day. That's amazing. So yeah. two-year anniversary, one-year anniversary. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. When I started it, I remember there's only a few guys who were successful with it that I knew. Pat Flynn was doing pretty well with it. Derek Halpern had a pretty decent audience, but he's kind of stopped since then and shifted. Um, Why did he stop? I think it was just like he wanted to do a bigger production, but then he realized it was a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And he was launching other products and making a lot of money doing his other stuff. So he was kind of like, eh, I don't know if I'm getting the results I want to. But he could probably pick it back up and be fine. Mm -hmm. Um, But Pat Flynn was like, podcasting was where I'm getting a lot of my traffic. And a lot of people are just so connected. They love it. I was like, and then this guy, John Lee Dumas, was doing it. And he started to see some traction. And I was like, okay. And then you have the other angle, too, which is like Mark Maron obviously gets a lot of traffic. Yeah, the NPR. Adam Carolla. Yes. And I was like, all right, it's starting to pick up. I still don't listen to them, but I'm seeing people in the media talk about them. I know the car thing, they're like going to be in every car in 2020 or something or whatever it is. No, I think in every 2016 model is, yeah, is coming out with a podcast yes. on the dashboard. It's pretty amazing. And I was just like, you know, I'd seen the trends from video where people are watching on demand, Netflix, Hulu, and YouTube is what I'd been seeing. It's like, okay, I didn't really watch much TV, but I watched my Hulu shows or my Netflix, you know, House of Cards. Like, I want to watch it now. And so I started saying, you know what? I think it's going to start shifting with audio, with like how it's happening. It's just been slow. Um, and I'm kind of like, I want to be the guy who goes to where, you know, what Wayne Gretzky says, where the puck is going, not where it's at right now. To go to where the puck's going to be or whatever he says. Right. And so I was like, you know, in two years, that's where everyone's going to be. They're going to be doing a podcast. People are going to be trying to figure out how to launch a podcast. And I'd rather be ahead of the game than behind it. And if I fail, well, then at least I went for it. And now everyone is launching a show, and there's courses about how to launch shows. 250,000 podcasts out there. It's insane. <laughs> and they're growing like five to 7,000 new shows a week. <laughs> Not episodes, new shows coming on iTunes a week. <clears throat> and uh, I'm just so grateful that I got into years ago because I think if I got it now, it'd be so much harder to yes. uh, get away from the noise. Well, even iTunes is just having problems uh, approving all the podcasts that they're getting. So, so they have, everybody's got to staff up. So it's it. it. And you can't do just an interview show in business unless you're a celebrity or a big name with an audience already. It's going to be really hard to get in. You've got to have some different angle. Like my friend uh, Rick Mulready just launched a show about the paid traffic podcast. So it's all about like paid traffic and like specific with ads for business, not just like a business show. Mm-hmm. So I think you got to get really specific if you're going to be successful. Yeah, it's like I, I um, just saw a podcast launch in the past couple of months. Uh, Denzel Washington is the greatest actor, period. 
That was the podcast. Yeah. And so every every episode, they analyze another Denzel Washington movie. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and I like how they, they spell out period. Like, Denzel Washington is the greatest <laughs> actor, period. But look, that's that's like a, a, a work of art, too. Like, yeah. I view that as, like, yeah. one project, which sure. which is, is nice. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, the next thing we're doing, I haven't really talked about it yet, but I'll, I'll announce it publicly on your show because I love you. <laughs> uh, I This either could be a huge failure or I think could be a pretty cool win. For the for my brand and my distribution level, I'm launching a digital magazine on iTunes here. Hopefully, in the next month, we're kind of finishing up the first uh, issue right now. And there's lots of digital magazines out there. There's tons of them, and there's tons of crappy ones out there that are just templated that look stupid. So, I am going into it with. I've been doing a lot of research and talking to a lot of people over in Asia and India. They don't listen to podcasts. They read magazines. And they read digital magazines. They like to have it access on their, their tablet and their iPhones. So my goal is to broaden my audience from the U.S., Australia, U.K., Canada, majorly right now, and broaden it to other parts of the world and bring them back into the podcast, podcast to the magazine, magazine to the book, and kind of create this trifecta of media content that creates a movement around greatness and around giving people access to the most inspiring people in the world like yourself Mm -hmm. that they normally would not be able to talk to and get the information from. So that's what I'm up to. And it's either going to be a a big win or a massive failure. That sounds great. So how much work is that going to be? Um... It's been a lot so far in the last two months because I'm hiring like a full design team to customize every page (laughs) and to make it unique, custom, and look completely different than all the other magazines out there. I want it to look like GQ. Um... And it's going to be a lot of work. I want to bring in great content and great design. The only magazines that I've looked at, I don't look at digital magazines myself, just like I don't really listen to podcasts. But the only ones that I do look at are the ones that have great design. And so I'm putting heavily a lot of money into the design. And then obviously the content's got to back it up. Hmm. So it's going to cost more than the podcast to produce every month. That's interesting. So... Podcast, magazine, you're still doing your webinars? Webinars, yep. Um, wh- how, what's the best way for people to find you, consume your content? Obviously, listening to your podcast, there's so much value there. Yeah. But uh, what, what, what do you consider the best ways for people to find you? The best way is my website, lewishouse.com, and then there's links to everything there. And then what, 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 do you want things, what, do, what things do you want people to see? Obviously, I mean, podcasts. I want people to see the podcast, yeah, and they're, and they're featured on the blog there. Um, that's really all I've got featured right now on my, my site is the podcast and my blog. When's your next big webinar that people can sign up for? There's webinars actually running every day. There's oh, really? Webinars. Yeah. So if you're on Facebook. And do you run them every day? I'm doing a lot of, I do live webinars about once every couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I do automated webinars every day. So my whole focus of 2015 is to automate my business. I, um. What is an automated webinar? It's like a robot recording. you? It's a recording <laughs> of a, we- a live webinar that I've done. Okay. That plays in that time period and then ends. At the I end see. Of it. So it's like a live play. It's like a live movie that you can't replay. Right. Um, <clears throat> and we've got people on the chat there who are chatting and answering questions. So it's like semi-live. People working for you who are answering questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People on my team. Uh, so those are happening all the time. And my goal is to... I would like to get to the point where I can generate $10,000 a day automated from webinars where I don't have to show up and have it all running through ads or my my site where I'm just sending people through my email content or they're signing up for webinars or content, getting on there and doing 10 sales a day, for $1,000 a sale. Wow. That's great. That's so that's, cool. look, that's three and a half million a year. And then what are your, what are your costs? Well, how much does your team cost you? Um, it's probably around 25,000 a month. Yeah. Okay. With like all the, the team and the expenses and things like that. Yeah. And the webinar is basically on how to build a bigger business. Yeah. How to connect with your audience, uh, on a deeper way, how to get your message out there to more people. And then also to see how to generate more sales. What's, what would you say is the number one advice for, uh, connecting in a deeper way to your audience? Well, People try to like sell just straight on their website or through a video or something like that, where I think it's, I mean, I've done a lot of research on webinars. I don't know if we talked about this in the last 
episode or not, but the, the best way to convert your audience members for the amount of time that you use is webinars. You can try to do a video sales later. It's not going to convert as much as webinars. You can try to do a launch, a big launch around something. It's not going to convert as much as webinars. Um, the only other thing that I can think of is like one-to-one sales where you actually mm. get a higher conversion rate. Mm. But anything online, webinars is the best. Mm. And you connect with people. Think about it. If you're in, for, in front of them for an hour to two hours, basically live with them. They see a video. They hear your voice. They are able to chat back and forth with you. You can make requests. You can say, hey, tell me what you're most grateful for on Twitter. And then you can reply to people from what they said on Twitter. You can have them take action live with you and then get instant results. You can have them take a poll uh, to get feedback. You can open up your live video and they can see you live. Mm -hmm. You can bring other guests on live and see their video. There's so many ways to interact with people from a webinar that you can't do all those ways at once unless you're in person with them. Mm -hmm. And I think to be able to scale a business why set yourself up to fail unless you're at least using webinars as part of your marketing and sales plan? Hmm. Okay. Well, look, Lewis Howes, thanks again for coming on my one-year anniversary, your two-year <laughs> anniversary of podcasing. So this is great. You, you've now the, the listeners have now learned completely how to be great. They don't even have to listen to your podcast, you but, I, but I still encourage people to do it because I think it's excellent. And uh, thanks very much, Lewis. Thank you. Again. For more from James, check out The James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network at stansberryradio.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. Taking a tour of where your finances can go? Good plan. See how Northwestern Mutual's approach to financial planning is designed for your goals. Goals like protecting loved ones, growing investments, and planning for retirement. With our interactive tour, you'll discover how growth and protection work together to help make your dreams a reality. See what goes into a good financial plan at northwesternmutual.com tour. The Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin.